everybody, Stacy here. I just wanted to wish everyone a very happy New Year's from Canada to the UK and everybody else who's watching from anywhere else in the world. Hope you guys really enjoy the presentations that the AGSD UK has put together for everybody. And if anyone wants more information on IMGSD, please do reach out and we'll be happy to get back to you. Happy New Year, everybody. Hi everyone and Happy New Year. My name is Stacy Reason and I'm going to talk to you about the International Association for Muscle Glycogen Storage Disease or in short IMGSD. I'll start off my talk to share with you all a little bit about who IMGSD is and then I'll move forward from there and talk about some of the things that we've done over this past very difficult and very challenging year. So IMGSD is an international organization, which is different from some of the other organizations such as the AGSD in the UK and the AGSD in the US, as an example. And the reason why we wanted to develop an international organization is we wanted to ensure that we would be able to communicate ideas and information and patient perspectives on an international, more broad level and keep that communication going between national organizations as well. So to that end, we are a patient advocacy group that supports national support groups, such as the AGSD. We support clinicians and researchers and scientists in all of the great work that they are doing. And first and foremost, we want to support patients and their families. IMGSD supports all muscle GSDs. However, the bulk of the information that we have to date and the research that has been done is on GSD-5 McCardles. And from that, we can take a lot of that information and apply it to Terui. Of course, there, there are exceptions. And we are always looking to expand our understanding and support for the other muscle GSDs. So this will be an ongoing developing process. Our mission is really simple. Like what is it that IMGST hopes to accomplish? Essentially, it is our intent to improve the quality of life for those who are affected by a muscle GSD, patients and family members alike. In order to do the work that we aim to do, in order to meet our mission, we have set forth a number of objectives. We want to raise awareness. So essentially, we want more people to know what muscle GSDs are. We want to provide support to patients, organizations, and medical professionals, both clinicians and researchers. So whatever support that looks like, whatever it is that those individuals require to improve their quality of life, that is what we aim to achieve. I personally think it is crucial that we are able to be a voice for patients so that we can share the patient experience with clinicians and researchers, those that care for us and those that are doing research, and also with those that are developing policy, perhaps around the care that we receive or how we receive that care. And then of course with patient organizations so that they can better support patients. We want to make sure we can get information out to people, whether it be research papers or the new clinical practice guidelines that are currently being developed for GSD 5 and 7. We want to be able to contribute to research that is being developed to ensure that it addresses the needs and the questions and the concerns that patients have. We hope to be able to communicate effectively across all borders so that what's happening in one country, if it's going well, we can carry that over to another country. And then ultimately, it would be fantastic to be able to lower the average age of diagnosis to 10 or less. 
In order to accomplish our mission and our objectives, we have a board. It is made up of 10 individuals on an international level. As you can see, we're represented by a number of different countries with Dan Chambers uh, highlighted in green here as he is our newest member. So in order to operationalize our objectives, IMGST has five key campaigns that we are working on right now. Now, these are fluid. They might change as the years pass, as we meet certain objectives, but this is sort of what we're working at now. And what I'm going to do is sort of go through each one of these campaigns and talk about some of the things that we have been working on in 2020 and that might carry forward through until 2021. So the first one is reducing the age of diagnosis. One of the things that um, is happening is there are a number of children diagnosed at the UK Centre of Expertise, and there's a number of children diagnosed at another centre in Australia. And so bringing together those two clinicians and the group of children that they have might prove to be helpful to better understand how it is that those children were able to be diagnosed at a young age. And if we can take that information and move forward, we might be able to work towards diagnosing other people at a young age as well. I want to share with you, all of you might already know Lucy or have seen her on uh, the website, either ours or the AGST UK. But I think Lucy really summarizes why it is so important to be diagnosed at a young age. So let's have a listen to what Lucy has to say. What were things like before you found out about McArdle's disease type 5? Really hard because my muscles and my, leg, my legs and they just keep hurting and, I, and like I get frustrated sometimes because I can't play the things that my friends are playing. But my friends in the McCar but once I found out about McCardles and I've met lots of friends and I'm really happy now that I'm not the only one. And what do your friends teach you? They teach they teach me about second wind and counting to thirty when your legs get tired. And how does that make things different now? Because because when you count to 30, it's like it gives your body and your legs time to have a break and then, then they have more energy to keep going. So how did you used to get round? I used to get around by using my wheelchair, but now I use this. Thank you, Lucy, for sharing that story with us. I think I've heard it, I don't know, a dozen times, but I always love hearing it just one more time. And so to further work towards our goal of reducing the age of diagnosis to under 10, it's important that we work together with other organizations that are similarly focused either on rare diseases or more specifically on muscle GSDs. And so the next two slides just cover a few of the partners that IMGSD works with in order to achieve that goal. So I'll just jump forward to the next slide. So this second slide has mostly GSD organizations in various different countries, as you can see here, the UK, US, Germany, France, Scandinavia, Spain, and Italy. So the next thing that we do, our second campaign, is to help patients to better understand how to manage 
day in and day out? How can they more easily do the things that they need to do and not run into difficulties? So some of the ways that we try to do that, um, I'll talk about in this next little segment. So one of which is simply through our website. We have one section on our website that talks about each of the muscle GSDs and a bit of an overview of each one. So individuals can gain a bit of a simple understanding. And then we have a number of different publications, leaflets, books, booklets, emergency cards, and those are all available on the website as PDFs. You can browse through them or download them. Um, and we're hoping to get our shop up and running soon that people could, if they so choose to do so, order them and then we could ship them out as well. The publications are all available in English, of course, and with each year passing, we are working on developing these in various other languages with French and German at present being the two um, ones that we have been working on. And then, of course, we have a number of different videos on our YouTube channel, a lot of them talking about the walking courses and patient experiences and some presentations that have been done over the years. We have another section on our website that looks at research updates. updates sorry, We try to update this page fairly consistency to, consistently rather, to ensure that the most current research papers are available for everyone to have a look at. We have another section, get involved. And on this section, we encourage patients to really participate in the muscle GSD community. So whether that's uh, involving themselves in some of the activities that we have throughout the year, uh, partaking on social media, or looking at some of the registries, one of the two patient registries. And then, of course, there is a medical section that has more specific information. Um, emergency guidelines would be one piece. And then, of course, we've updated this section to have information on the COVID-19 pandemic that our scientific advisory board put together. Another way in which we're working to ensure patients really get the most out of the information that is presented is by attending conferences. Generally every year IMGSD will attend the AGSD conference in the US and in the UK and in Germany. This year of course things were a little bit different with two of the three having an online um, conference available and Germany had opted to cancel it probably because it was so close to the very beginning of the pandemic and just not enough time to organize an online conference. And then of course there's social media. So Facebook really is a place where a lot of our um, patients or members get together and are able to ask questions, introduce themselves, meet others. We take the opportunity to share with everybody things that are new and upcoming, whether it be events that are happening, fundraisers that are happening, papers that are released, whatever it might be, we really use this tool as a resource to be able to reach out. As you can see, we have quite a few members, over 3,300 in total across five different Facebook groups. So again, because the numbers are much higher in McCardles, our first group was McCardle disease, and that has 2,300 members, patients, family, and then some ancillary members. We have a McCardle's parents group because some of the issues that they'll be talking about are a little bit different than the, the main group. We have a ketosis in McCardle's group because that was a very popular topic. As you can see, almost 900 members are in that group, and it was really overrunning the threads in the, the previous two. Teruwi's disease certainly going to be much smaller because there are far fewer people. And GSD9D is the newest group, just only a month or so old that we have pulled together. These are, I should say, by the way, all private groups as well.
but they are searchable for those who, who want to uh, seek them out. And then one of the other campaigns is to encourage regular physical activity. And this can be a really difficult concept to understand, particularly for those who are newly diagnosed. Here we are telling people who have a muscle GSD with a primary symptom of exercise intolerance that they need to get out there and be more active. <laughs> so it's a really difficult concept for some many to grasp. And so we try to put a lot of effort into explaining this in a way that most people will be able to take something positive away from it. So over the course of 2020, even though it was a very unusual year, we did a variety of different things. We started off in February, just before the pandemic really took hold, at least here in North America. And that was Rare Disease Day, a particularly rare disease, rare day, excuse me, this year being the 29th of February. And the intent was to host a Get Moving campaign to encourage everyone to get active every single day. And it was going to run from Rare Disease Day through until the beginning of Global Walking Week in May, which was 11 weeks. And interestingly, uh, McArdle's is on the 11th chromosome. So we had a little bit of a, a theme going on there. Um, so that did take place, but of course it was a little low key this year because everything with the pandemic took over naturally. We had put together some clothing, t-shirt and sweatshirts that said second wind is my superpower and those were very well received. So in May, we had the annual Global Walking Week and this is the fifth year running that we've done that. So everybody across the world, wherever they are, over the course of one week, uh, gets outside and moves their body, whether it be walking a block, a mile or 10, and they record it and we add up the cumulative distance for everybody during that week. And it's a motivational time that we can all be together doing one thing towards a common goal. In July, this was the 10th anniversary of the walk over Wales, where four of us walked the length of Wales, 330 kilometers to raise money and awareness for McArdles. That was in 2010. And so to celebrate that, we uh, had a Moving My Muscle Month. And again, the same thing. We just wanted people to get out there and commit to doing something active every single day. And then of course, generally, there are the annual walking courses in Wales, but those were canceled due to the pandemic. So the next um, campaign that we have is to work on clinical practice guidelines. So let's go back and, and take just a short step backwards to understand why these are needed. Most people experience a delay between when they first have symptoms and when they're diagnosed. For myself, I wasn't diagnosed till I was 38 years old and I would probably say I was around four or five years of age when I first remember having symptoms. And then once people are diagnosed, they often don't have access to the proper information or care, right? So a diagnosis alone isn't enough. We need to be able to support people to ensure that they're able to manage properly. And when they're not able to manage properly, they could end up, end up doing more harm and not learning the management skills for day to day or how to recognize an episode of severe muscle breakdown, rhabdomyolysis, and the risks that uh, are associated with that. And that can have a very negative effect on individuals, both physically and psychologically. Because GSD 5 and 7 are so rare, it stands to reason that many clinicians have never seen a patient with either of these disorders and so therefore they wouldn't really appreciate all of the nuances surrounding managing these. So the goal of course 
for a clinical practice guideline is to develop this resource that clinicians can use and patients that will address the, the uh, issues that I previously mentioned. So these clinical practice guidelines are for GSDs 5 and 7. The primary audience for these are neuromuscular specialists, neurologists, geneticists, and pediatricians. And then of course, secondary to that would be primary care physicians, emergency physicians, maybe nephrologists, patients, family members, and then the community at large. We have an international group that are working on these clinical practice guidelines. There are 12 experts in their field that are working on the, the clinical practice guidelines. At present, we are working on draft two and hoping to publish these, I would say within the first few months of 2021. So stay tuned, we will certainly let everybody know when these are available. So the last campaign that we have is contributing to research. I've pulled together, I did a really quick search, and this is not comprehensive by any means, but I pulled together some of the research papers that have been published for 2020 alone. Most, I think all but one, are for GSD-5, so I didn't even get into all of the other GSDs, but I must say, I often get asked the question, is there any research being done in McArdle's or in Terui or any of the muscle GSDs? And I'm very happy to report that there is quite a bit of research being done. So I've put up all of the references so folks can go back and perhaps look into these a little bit further. I'm not going to spend uh, much time talking about these. I understand Dr. Ros Quinn Liven will be doing a presentation in the upcoming month and she will focus in on uh, what's happening uh, with regards to research in this area. So all that I do want to mention, however, is that there are a few of these um, research papers whereby our patient advocacy organization and others such as the AGSD are able to contribute to the development of research. And so what I mean by that, if you take the last one on this particular screen, it's talking about the Euromac registry. And I'll just jump forward one slide because the first one on the second slide is also talking about the Euromac registry. And the reason why I point these ones out is that patient advocacy organizations such as IMGSD or the AGSD do a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure that patients are aware of the registries, to promote them, to contribute to the questions that are being asked, because we want to make sure that we are getting the right information from patients. And this goes a long way to helping improve the understanding, the overall understanding of these disorders. And I'll talk about patient registries in just a little bit. The second one here um, is talking about a ketogenic diet in McArdles. A couple of years ago in 2018, IMGSD hosted a nutrition summit and we brought together a lot of the clinical experts in McArdles and we talked about a low carb ketogenic diet from the patient perspective and, and what patients were thinking about this particular nutrition management strategy. And from that meeting that we had two years ago, there's been a few clinical studies that have come out. And so I really want to highlight the point that as patients, we have a voice and it's strong and we are able to make change. And there's a few more studies here. Again, I won't get into these because I'm sure Dr. Quinn Levin is going to talk about these in greater detail. And then lastly, there's a couple more. Um, one was just a review of a ketogenic diet. And the last one is using ketosis in GSD type 7, Truly. 
And then if you do want to jump on clinicaltrials.gov, I have the link here at the bottom, and there's a few more studies that are going on as well that you can have a look at. Okay, so I wanted to circle back to patient registries because it really deserves a little bit more of a talk. Um, a registry really in its most simplest terms is defined as a system that uses observational methods to collect data on a specific population, so whether it be just McArdles or all muscle GSDs, and they follow that over a period of time. There's a couple of registries, the Euromac registry, which many of you may be aware of. There's quite a few people with McArdles already registered in this registry. And there's a video here if you follow the link that talks about the Euromac registry. And the second one is the CORDS registry, Coordination of Rare Diseases at Sanford. And IMGSD recently um, brought in muscle GSDs into this registry database. And it's different from the Euromac registry in that patients can enter their own data. So it's more patient focused than clinician focused. And so the goal for both of these is that we're able to collect de-identified data and look at it and say, wow, we didn't really know that this was a symptom or that was a symptom or, you know, you can just, you can imagine the possibilities when you look over the data but also looking over the data over a period of time, right? Is there progression of symptoms? Do certain things make it better or worse? So there's lots of different ways. And then beyond all of that, of course, is the opportunity to have a pool of participants that might be interested in participating in other research studies. So if you want to learn a little bit more about registries, of course, you can visit our website and we have some more information there. The link is at the bottom of this page. Okay, and lastly, I just want to touch on funding and grants because that's always a part of nonprofit organizations. Earlier this year, at the very beginning of the year, Helix, which is a UK-based biotech company, put out a call for applications for a $1 million grant. They have developed a rare treatment accelerator using artificial intelligence to take, well, discover and or develop repurposed treatments. And so we went through that application procedure and it was a very interesting procedure to go through applying for a grant. Unfortunately, we were not successful as they only choose one of many, um, but we can reapply on the next round. So we'll certainly keep everybody uh, up to date as to, to what we're doing with that. And then secondly, Reneo Pharmaceutical, who is currently running a clinical trial for McArdles, um, they have partnered with us and they've been a huge support attending our conferences and they recently donated to IMGSD $5,000 so that we're able to publish our clinical practice guidelines so that everybody can access them. They're not stuck behind a paywall. So we really do appreciate the support of our partners such as Reneo. And that wraps up my discussion. If there's anything that you want to learn more about with regards to IMGSD, please feel free to visit us and you could uh, even send an email and we'll get back to you straight away. Wishing you all the very best in 2021.